welcome to the Insomnia Project. I hope you're enjoying our holiday episodes. Today's episode, I'm going to take you back four years to an episode I did with fan favorite and my father-in-law, Dan Barker. This was the first holiday episode I had done with him, and he was a little bit apprehensive. It was recorded on a marble table, which is the less than ideal surface to be recording an episode. And you'll hear some noises in the background. That's my mother-in-law being very, very quiet. So you'll hear some noises and some wrestling and she's doing her best to be quiet. There's some noises when my father-in-law hits his hand on the table, but otherwise I think it's a very charming episode. You can hear Dan sort of open up towards the latter part of the of the episode and he really gets into it and tells a story that I had never heard of before with his encounter with a famous musician. I'll leave it at that for you to listen to. So at the top of the episode, I asked him what the holidays were like in New Brunswick, Canada, and here's what he had to say. It was always a little bit of snow and, you know, the holiday spirit and everything. And we had three kids in the house and so it was, it was a good time for my wife and I, you know, to to have the family together like that. Sure. With the, all the kids there as well, right? Yeah. You have three mm-hmm. kids, um, two of which have been on our podcast. Uh-huh. And I imagine it would be um, quite a scene of snow in New Brunswick um, for the holidays. It was... Very typical of you Norman Rockwell type of uh, Christmas because we did always have the cold and the snow and we'd always do the traditional uh, presents in the morning and then have a a bit of a, a breakfast brunch type of thing sure. and then have the big meal in the afternoon. What's your favorite thing to eat around the holidays? Oh, wow. That's probably the desserts more than anything else, <laughs> you know. Can't beat a good slice of pumpkin pie. Sure. And how does your holiday experience differ now that you live in Florida? Well, I mean, for one thing, here we are halfway through November and the uh, median temperature is 85 to 89 degrees. So... Uh, you know, one day kind of rolls into the the next, and you don't have that that type of uh, seasonal change. You know, it's just kind of goes on. So, unless you're looking at a calendar, you really wouldn't know when Christmas was. I just saw a gator swim by the canal, and that's not necessarily an animal that you associate with the holidays. No, not at all. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, that's the, that's the other aspect is that uh, the fauna and the flora and the, and the animals are all different down here. <laughs> I know that the Christmas tree here in Florida often is decorated with different uh, shells and starfish and things like that. People like to adopt the beach uh, motif, if you will. Uh, and so you know, they try to take advantage of it and... And yes, they will decorate with the uh, the shells and the uh, you know picture of the porpoises or whatever. <laughs> I remember when we celebrated a Christmas in Nashville. You had the tallest tree inside a house I had ever seen. Yeah, we had a uh, was it fifteen foot uh, a living room, which ceiling most probably was up about twenty plus feet. Mm-hmm. And we actually had a catwalk that went across to the bedrooms. And so we, <laughs> Mother bought this giant artificial tree. Mm-hmm. And that was quite a task, putting that together and, and decorating. And in fact, the star, we finally got wise and put the uh, tree next to the catwalk so I could put the star on top. Sure. Sure, but that was a that was a what was it a fifteen foot tree or was it taller? It was about fifteen. I, I don't think it was eighteen. I okay, was, yeah, fifteen. And what was the holidays like in Nashville, Tennessee? 
Well, Nashville, you had a little bit of the seasonal change. Mm -hmm. I mean, you didn't have the the snow that I grew up with or the snow up in Canada or anything of that nature, but it was always a bit cool, sometimes rainy. Sure. Um, it was uh, a little little less stressful for my wife okay. because, uh, you know, the, the kids had grown and gone off, got married and everything, and um, some Christmases we had uh, one or two kids there, but... Usually it was just us. The um, music in Nashville must have played a part for Christmas. Well, Nashville does do Christmas uh, very nicely. Uh, they uh, We have the Opryland, and they deck out the uh, Opryland, uh, uh, you know, shall I call it quite robust with Christmas uh Decorations. If you go into the Opryland Hotel, there's Christmas trees uh, every 10, 12 feet. Right. I mean, they really do it up. And we saw a Christmas car- uh, concert at the uh, Grand Old Opry, And that's right? the other thing, is that they do Christmas uh, concerts. Uh, what is nice is just before Christmas, usually the week before Christmas, um, you will get uh, people... They, kind of donate their services and everybody ends up down at uh, the old Ryman and they'll do a Christmas concert and you're not quite sure who's going to walk out on stage you know uh, Nashville not only has a lot of talent but a lot of superstars and uh, it's, it's uh, during those concerts it was usually you'd, you'd see the, the local celebrities all get up there sing a song or two it was very nice. Sure. Now, jumping forward in the holidays to New Year's, you have some great New Year's story of, stories of when you used to play in bands. <laughs> yeah. I suppose the, uh, the favorite family one is simply that uh, when we had our, our first child, Rebecca, she was born on New Year's Day. Mm-hmm. And I had to do a, a gig of course, for New Year's Eve. And the gig uh, was a, a long one, five sets up until two in the morning. And just as I'm getting ready to leave, my wife informs me she's uh, she's in labor. So I don't know what to do. I, I couldn't stay home necessarily because you just can't get a, a relief at the last minute like that on New Year's. So she insisted I go with it. It would be quite a while and where were you playing oh that's a good question like was it far from the home uh yeah it was uh well it was about 20 miles away okay um it was at a club uh we were wearing i was wearing uh we were all wearing tuxedos i had a brocade tuxedo what's that um kind of like a paisley tuxedo Those are in fashion now, so you know they, if, if well, you have it, dust it off because yeah, no, well, I'd never be able to get into it <laughs> not nowadays. Um, but anyways, so uh, you know, I did, we we kicked off the New Year's, and every break I got, I'd call home, see how she was doing, and she was having some severe uh, cramps and stuff. And this is your first child. This is our first child. So, not knowing what to do, I called my in-laws who lived down the street. And said, look, uh, your daughter is in labor. Mm-hmm. I'm not there. And I couldn't possibly get back there even if I left. It sure. would take me a, a good 45 minutes or more. And so I, they had guests uh, entertaining another couple that night. Threw them out the door. <laughs> came, came running down to our little our little house. And, uh, and our little house was a, used to be a one-room schoolhouse. And we put an apartment on one end and my wife's studio on the other. And so the bedroom was upstairs. So what took place was simply that uh, my father-in-law stayed downstairs and watched Guy Lombardo. My mother-in-law went upstairs and the TV upstairs and she was watching Lawrence Welk. (laughs) So my my poor, poor wife is in labor listening to Guy Lombardo and Lawrence Welk battle it out in the house. 
Uh, she's never forgiven me for calling them. And then, and then what happened? Well, what happened is I, I got through the gig, ran home, got her to the uh, the hospital. We had already talked to the doctor to to warn him, and she stayed in labor until one o five the next afternoon. So, did you play until midnight? Played until two in the morning. You played till two in the morning yeah. on December thirty first. Yeah, you came home. Yeah. And then you and your wife went to the hospital, mm-hmm. and your daughter was born at what time? One o five in the afternoon. Oh, in the afternoon. So okay. it was quite a long labor. Sure. Um, I, of course, didn't change, so I was still wearing my brocade tuxedo. <laughs> the doctor takes one look at me and says, "Wow, you really dress for the occasion." <laughs> and Becca Barker was born. And Becca Barker was born. And she is a guest on our podcast, so if you listen to past episodes, you'll hear her talk about a variety of different things. And what a way to be born with her dad in a tux. Yeah. And how do you traditionally spend New Year's now? Uh, or, in, or in New Brunswick, or in Flor- or Florida here, or in Nashville, Massachusetts. What are your New Year's rem- memories? Yeah, we, we try to do something. Uh, it's difficult. It's, uh, in Florida, uh, there was a, uh, a band um, made up of uh, the uh, local symphony. That oh. would play at a hotel. And for a few years, we would go and stay the night at the hotel, listen to the band, have a good meal. Uh, the only difficulty was we really, you know, you, you meet people, and that's great, but we really didn't know any uh, anybody. Uh, one year, we took you and your wife. Yes. And, uh, and that was great. But uh, we got tired of that, and we tried to find stuff like down... We have a place called Hiram's, and back then they did a private party in their big uh, room, and one year we did that, and they had a nice little band playing up there, etc. But again, you're you're with you're not with family or friends, so it's a little different. You sure, know, and you, sure. And then other Christmas, uh, New Year's, and Christmases, we might. Um, Go away. Mm-hmm. Um, we went to the Smokies one time with you guys. Exactly. Yeah. That's one of our favorite places up by there, by Pigeon Forge, because mm-hmm. it's always a, a party time up there. Yeah. You know, a lot of people love to have a good time. And they decorate it so, so sweetly up there. They do. They do. And that's definitely Dolly Parton's influence, shall we say. Oh, really? Um, well, if you go to the theme park, et cetera. They that's do Dollywood. Dollywood, around just before Christmas, they bring in some tremendous shows, international shows. Uh, one year it was, we, it was great. We saw our Irish, uh, an Irish show that would rival uh, the uh, dance troupe and singing and all of that of Irish, and then oh, there's several other countries, Italians. Uh, uh, and it was all different. It was all great. Mm-hmm. Really good. Now, speaking of theme parks in Florida, you had mentioned to me earlier that Disney, they put up their decorations, their holiday decorations, in one day. Yeah, that was something we heard on the news, Mm -hmm. uh, because I wasn't aware of that up until this year. And Disney, you can only imagine the crew they would have to bring in to do this for all their parks, etc., Disney World. But they did it all in one day and one night. Wow, that must involve thousands of people. Must have. Wow. Must have. So, since I'm sitting in front of a musician, I want to ask you, what are your favorite holiday tunes? Oh, uh, always talking Christmas? Yeah, or whatever, yeah. or whatever yeah. you, songs around the holidays that you enjoy. Well. Because there's some that aren't necessarily associated with Christmas, like Jingle Bells, I guess, Dashing Through the Snow. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I guess I like more the sentimental types of tunes. Okay. You know, um, you know, uh, White Christmas mm-hmm. or uh, some of the old standards that way. Um, I would have guessed the Lim- Little Drummer Boy. 
Yeah, I mean, I remember as a kid, mm-hmm. about nine, ten years old, I had an album of Christmas tunes, and okay. Little Drummer Boy was like the first cut. Um, and then, of course, there's always the famous David Bowie and, and Bing Crosby rendition of yes. it. Uh, which I like. So, um, but other tunes, um, you know, there are, there are some there, and uh, my mind's drawn blank. No, it's all good. But uh, how about to play? Well, the f- thing was back when I was playing, I was playing mostly top forty rock and roll, okay. right? Right. And so for Christmas, we never rehearsed anything. So if one of the, say the bass player knew what song, he'd say, okay, here's the chord structure. And I'll sing it, and off we go. Oh, I see. I mean, some renditions, you wouldn't be able to tell what tune it was. Earlier, we were talking about um, people who write Christmas songs. And you had mentioned that Mel Torme had written a song. Right, right. Um, which is, I think, called a Christmas song. And most people know it with the line, chestnuts roasting on an open, open fire. fire. Yeah. Yeah. And he wrote that when he was rather young. So, you know, it's it certainly has uh, weathered the years. Sure. But it's special to me because uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him one day. Oh, you did? I did. I was working at uh, the Zildjian Symbol Company. Mm-hmm. And I was coming back from a break, most probably the lunch break. And I got delayed somehow, and I didn't want the foreman to see me coming back from the break late. Right. So I'm running down the the hallway, and to go into what we call the vault, where we kept all the product. All the symbols? All the symbols. There was a big double door. Okay. And so I'm running down the hallway. There's no mirrors or anything, so... Just as I got to the door, I go bolting right in, take one step in, and bang, I hit somebody. Oh, no. And I knew who I hit was quite short. <laughs> okay. Because I was towering over him. And uh, I was afraid it was my boss, the owner of the company. Right. Who, who only stood about five foot two or so. Okay. And so, you know, I, I hit him hard, and I immediately wrapped my arms around him, but I couldn't hold him up. And so he goes backwards, and I'm over him, gently laying him on the floor. And as I'm looking down, nose to nose, I looked, and I said, Hey, you're Mel Torme. He raises his right hand, shakes my hand, says, Glad to meet you. And he's on the ground at this point? And he's on the ground. He's on the floor. And I... I thought, oh, my Lord. And, of course, everybody's standing around watching him. But he was a, he was a great uh, storyteller. Uh, what was going on was <clears throat> he was doing a, a club act. Mm-hmm. And his drummer was a young guy named uh, Donnie Osborne, Jr. Okay. His Donnie Osborne, Sr. was the president of Slingland Drum Company. And so uh, Donnie Osborne Jr. and Mel would do what we called swapping fours and eights, meaning it was kind of a drum off. Oh. One, so they'd have two drum sets there. I see. And Mel to him, he did play drums as well as other instruments. In fact, he had perfect pitch. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that was one thing. Uh, so at any rate, uh, they would do a drum battle. So they, they stopped by the factory to get some fresh cymbals, some new cymbals. But I had no idea they were due in. Nobody did. They mm-hmm. just, you know, showed up. Sure. And anyways, uh, but that, he, he was quite a guy. It sounds like he had a great sense of humor, too. Oh, he did. He told us stories, you know, about Buddy Rich was a good friend of his. Right. And um, people have a, one impression of Buddy. And Mel has known him since way back, one of sure. the big band days. And told us some great stories that have happened through the years. Um, and he, he just kept us entertained all afternoon. Of it course. was wonderful. Did you ever meet him subsequently after the laying him down gently on, on the ground? <laughs> no. Because <laughs> I'd love to know if he remembered that. I, I'm sure he remembers it. Because 
because when I hit him, I mean, you know, I was a big strapping young guy, and I was running at full speed. So, yeah, <laughs> he knew he was it. <laughs> Describe to me your perfect Christmas day. I like, uh, now that I'm older, I guess, but I like a low-key Christmas. Okay. Um, not rush to do anything, sure. you know. Um, we no longer had really have family around, uh, you know, so we were on the phone quite a bit. Sure. But, um, opening presents through Skype, which is a modern day thing that quite a few, quite a few people do now. Yeah. Um, definitely we do that. We have the one grandchild and we, you know, want to, want to see him open his presents, uh, and uh, you know, with with the others, the same. Um, you know, that's that's uh, become a tradition. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. Is there a present you remember receiving as a child or later in life that really struck you on Christmas? When I was a child, it was in the late fifties to mm-hmm. early sixties, and I lived in a neighborhood. We had a lot of kids. It was a post-war uh, neighborhood that was built. This is in Massachusetts, right? Massachusetts, yeah. And so, you know, we would do the traditional wake up early, get the presents open, see what you got. But it always reminded me of uh, something a little more simpler because we would get maybe one big present or some small ones. And we wouldn't necessarily know what the big present might be. So, uh, one Christmas, something I didn't even ask for, I got a Lionel train set. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, I have an older brother, 10 years older than I am, and my father. And the two of them decided, well, we'll mount this train set on a big piece of plywood we have down in the cellar. Well, I didn't want that. Okay. I wanted to be able to break it down, set it up differently, etc. But they wouldn't listen. They didn't care. Right. So they ended up doing that. And, uh, of course, Christmas Day, they played with it more than I did. Oh. Um, but that, that, I remember that because it was something I didn't ask for. I didn't really care about But But apparently my father, my brother did. <laughs> Do you ever see uh, Lionel train sets at flea markets uh, that you go to or you attend? You often might see a train set. Okay. Uh, but it's not necessarily Lionel. Okay. Uh you know, you see more H and O scale trains than anything. But uh, once in a while, yeah, because there, there are some old people that have collected them and didn't give them up. Right, because they're worth, I think they're worth some money, aren't oh, they? Oh, worth a lot of money. Yeah. I have a friend that collects trains. That's his hobby. And uh, it's amazing what they get now for a locomotive. or How much would your thing. set be worth in today's oh, money? Uh, a few hundred dollars, okay. I guess. Yeah, I mean, back then it was probably was a twenty nine ninety five deal, you know, or right. something like that. But, but uh, you know, it was, it was rather simple. You could either do a big oval track or you do a figure eight. Sure. Um, and, that, you know, that was it. And then you just add things along. Right, along, of course. Along the way. Um. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's there are uh, uh, displays. We go to a place right down the street called McKee Gardens, and they have a building where they put up a big train display. So, you know, if I want to see train sets, I can go down there. Fair enough. But that's not necessarily your thing. No. No. no, that's just one of the memorable gifts you got. What was um, Christmas like in Massachusetts? I, I, we, we talked about Nashville and mm-hmm. Florida and a little bit about New Brunswick, but we didn't get... This is kind of the episode where we talk about multi-city or multi-place uh, holiday. Well, Massachusetts, like I said, um, grew up in a post-war development. Mm-hmm. Lots of kids, lots of kids my age. <laughs> and I remember that what we would do is that... You know, around noontime, we want to go out and play. Now, we might have snow. It might rain, or it might just be a great sunny day. Oh, I would have thought Boston would have had had snow. 
Uh, not all the time. Okay. No, no. no. Um, January would be when you'd expect the snow. I January see. January and February. So uh, what would happen is you'd think we'd all bring our toys outside and play, you know, the new toys. Sure. I don't remember that. You know, we would get together and and uh, maybe play soldier with our old toys or uh, ride bicycles, especially like if one kid got a bicycle. Well, we'd all get our bikes out and, you know, go around the neighborhood and whatever. So it, it was kind of funny that way. Um, I mean, sometimes we brought our new toys out and inevitably break something, yeah. <laughs> you were saying something dawned on you? Well, we always would have stockings uh, hung on the, by the fireplace. Mm-hmm. And, of course, as young kids, what do you do? You go around looking for the biggest socks you can find to put up there. You know? So they were actually uh, stockings that were in use as well. Oh, yeah, saying. absolutely. Oh, yeah, we didn't have any of these fancy ones here. Yeah. No, these were these were actually in use. Uh, you'd have to, I'd have to read my father's uh, sock drawer, you know, and look for some big, heavy woolen uh, socks that he might have. But no matter what they put in the socks, what you always got was a, a fruit. It was an apple or an orange. Okay. Um, and you always knew, because uh, it was always at the toe of the foot. So even before you go into it, all you do is feel around and go, oh, I got an apple this year, or I got an orange. Right. And most probably you'd never eat it. You'd just you'd throw it in the fruit bowl or something. Because right. Because you didn't care. And then there'd also be nuts, like walnuts and whatever. And then, of course, maybe a little uh, charm or a, a Mickey Mouse watch or whatever. Uh, which would be the big thing in the sock, you know. One year, my mother, for whatever reason, thought it would be funny, because they put their socks up too. And uh, all she did was put coal in my father's sock. <laughs> <laughs> and that, you know, that was a bit of a bit of a family joke for a while, you know, because they said, oh, Dad, you were bad this year, huh? Right. <laughs> Did you ever play Santa now that you sit in front of me with a white beard? Um, I did. Uh, when we were first married, my father-in-law, who was a big man, yes. weighed 360 pounds. And very tall, right? Six foot two or so. Okay. Yeah, but he he was big, and uh, he always played Santa. Okay. Loved to play Santa. In fact, he would take his vacation from work before Christmas so that he could be a Department store Santa. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Which store? Oh, uh, well, when the malls first came out, Mm -hmm. he he had a couple malls he did. This is in Boston or Weymouth? Well, it'd be down in the South Shore. In the South Shore. Yeah, Braintree and then Hanover built a mall and... uh, and I mean, he just looked the part. Right. And he spent a lot of money on a great outfit. Um, I mean, even with the boots. I mean, big black boots and I mean, there was nothing, uh, it wasn't a costume. It, it was it was pretty much the real thing. And he just loved doing that. Um, so, when uh, my wife taught dance, and we started off having a, uh, a Christmas party, and then during the party there would be a little bit of show of showing the kids, and then that eventually came out to be a, um, a show, an actual recital type of show. And then Santa would come out at the very end and have, you know, take all the kids on his knee and whatever. And that was me. I did that for a few years. My father in law did it at first, but as he got older, et cetera, you know, I, I took it. Then he passed away. Right. Then I took over for a few years. Um, and my, I would use his outfit which the beard was very authentic and so mm-hmm. But I also have these granny glasses, and that's that kind of hid, you know, even my own kids weren't sure who the heck it was underneath all that. So, yeah, it was fun. What's your advice to anyone who's playing Santa? 
Well, not to be too fake. I okay. mean, a lot of guys get up there and try to do the hoo 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 stuff, you know, right. and it's the kids see right through that. <laughs> but you know, you talk to them and listen to them, what they're saying, and the key is. As the kid is telling you what they want, you're looking at the mother or father, and they're going, "Yeah, the nod in the head, yes, yeah, so, no, yeah." And so you'd have to say something like, "Well, you know, that might be a tough one for Santa. I can't really promise you that." Right. You know, but uh, yeah, and, and so being honest with them. Um, the thing about my father-in-law, mm -hmm. which I didn't mention, is my mother-in-law would dress up as Mrs. Claus. Oh. Yeah, so it would be a pair, you know, and she'd be like the helper at the at the store, et cetera. Um, so the, the dynamic duo. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, she had a good heart. And she enjoyed the kids as much as he did, I think. There you go. That's what the holidays are supposed to be about anyways. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. What are your fondest Christmas or holiday memories with your kids? Is there ever, was there ever a gift or something that you guys did uh, for the holiday season with your kids that, that strikes, strikes you? Apart from your daughter being born around New Year's. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are some very nice memories. Mm -hmm. um, the kids, when we moved to New Brunswick... Uh, you know, the youngest was about seven or eight years old, and the oldest, uh, 14 or so. And uh, I remember we'd get up, and uh, we always had warm pajamas because it was a, a little farmhouse. It was drafty and cold sometimes. And there you'd get snow. Oh, we would have snow or ice, yeah, usually then. Uh, but, you know, uh, the... You asked about fondest memories. Sure. I think the I think one Christmas really encapsulated a lot because I tried to buy my my wife a lot of things that I and not necessarily anything she asked for. Okay. So <clears throat> she would you know, we would all take turns opening presents. Mm -hmm. Well, when it got to be her turn she'd open a present usually from me and just as she's opening, she'll look in the package and go, oh, no, you didn't buy me that. <laughs> and this went on, like, for every <laughs> present that one Christmas. And if you ask the kids, they, that's a fond memory. They remember that very, very distinctly. Oh, yes, they still bring it up. Yeah, and, I mean, my children would come to my defense and say, look how much effort Dad put into doing, getting all those presents in it. I remember one present was a boom box. She absolutely hated that. Right. Um, and then, you know, appliances for the house and other things. And But nothing she liked. Now, I once bought your daughter a gift for Christmas. And when she opened it, she did not. She was like, oh, why did you get this? I don't want this, blah, blah, blah. And now she uses it every day and she loves it. And she'll always turn to me and say, this is one of the best things I ever got. <laughs> did that happen on your end? Not that Christmas. Okay. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> As we conclude this episode, um, is there anything holiday related that comes up that we haven't mentioned? Well, as a kid growing up, again, this is late 50s, mm -hmm. early 60s, I remember that I had neighbors that would do crafts. Okay. I mean, one gentleman would. We had birch trees and would cut pieces of birch logs off and drill them as candlestick mm -hmm. and decorate them as sure. candlestick uh, holders. And one year, I, rem I remember, I was invited along with the family to basically go around, not our neighborhood, but the next town over to sell these things. Oh. So I remember going door to door as a little... Uh, an urchin, if you will, okay. try to sell these things. <laughs> and not until later did I think about that and go, yeah, you know, that, that was pretty uh, low class to do that. 
Oh, I think it's in the spirit of Christmas. So it was a log that had holes drilled in for for candles. For candles. Yeah, yeah. And you know, the fa- family would put these things together. There were two kids, and that would be uh, something they did a couple of weeks before Christmas and whatever. And, uh, like I said, one once uh, I was invited to go out and hawk these things. <laughs> There you go. Well, Dan, thank you so much for being a guest yet again on our podcast. We, of course, wish you all the best for the holidays. Well, the same to you and all your uh, uh, people out there. Yeah, and we look forward to having you on Season 3 in the new year. For everyone else, we hope that you have a holiday that is filled with light and candles and celebration and peace and a lot of sleep. As always, the Insomnia Project is produced by Drumcast Productions, and this particular special holiday episode is recorded in Florida, and we look forward to more holiday episodes.